this morning. We're going to continue uh, in the series that we've had in the book of First, Second, and Third John, and today is the last uh, um, message in the series. We're going to be uh, talking. Um, th- we're going to be going through Third John together. And I believe there's a very important message for the church in this book. Um, you know, oftentimes um, these three books aren't preached a lot about. Uh, not, they're not preached a lot because there's a lot of repetition in um, in the themes throughout First, Second, and Third John. There's an awful lot of repetition that takes place, and because week after week you're dealing with the same sort of topics, the same sort of issues, it's kind of been something that's a lot of pastors shied away from. They pe- preach one sermon here and one sermon there in First John. But I hope you appreciate, uh, you've, you guys have gl- gleaned something from the series um, because the emphasis is there for a reason. The Lord has given his word uh, to emphasize different things for reasons. And um, yeah, let's pray before, the, let, let's just pray before we open the word this morning. And Jesus, we, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the fact that we can come before you together as a family and we can open your word and that your word is truth, your word is life. And, and God, there's so many things that we can learn and every time we open it, Lord, we can uh, learn something new. And um, this morning, we just, I just pray, Lord, that you'd help me to explain this in a way that honors you and uh, that your word would come forth to change hearts and lives. And we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. So, this morning, 3 John, just as the second epistle of John was written um, to a lady, if you look at 2 John in the beginning, um, it was written to a lady and her children in the faith. Um, The book of 3 John was written to a man named Gaius. And Gaius um, is addressed in the very beginning of the book. Um, If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn or follow the overhead here. Um, although Third John does not, I guess you could say, directly introduce doctrinal uh, principles and precepts one after the other, uh, like some of the other um, epistles do, um, there's, the apostle emphasizes things in Third John that give important insights into the life of the church and the struggles of the early church at the close of the age of the apostles. And I, I believe there's lessons that were purposely sewn into this for us to glean throughout the centuries and, and where we are here today. This is as applicable, applicable to us today as it was in, we believe that this was written in about AD 90. So it's applicable today just as it was back then. So in First John, Uh, The Apostle discusses fellowship with God. That's kind of the overarching um, theme of the book. In in 2 John, he forbids fellowship with false teachers, talks a lot about that. And and in 3 John, the Apostle encourages fellowship in the Christian community, and he is addressing this man named Gaius. And Gaius is a special person, and let's start into this letter together. Verse 1 says this, the elder, John refers to himself as the elder, and I'm not going to go over why again this week, because we talked about that last week, but he said, it says, the elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. So, in 2nd and 3rd John, the apostle tells both of the people that he addresses, the lady in 2nd John, and Gaius here, that he loves them in the truth. Well, that, that was stated for a reason. You see, Gaius was a man who evidently had a life-altering, life-changing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He had come to the knowledge of the truth of who Jesus is and everything that Jesus represents. And we can confidently confidently say by what we see here in this book that um, Gaius was a true disciple of Jesus Christ. 
A man who walked in the freedom of God's truth. And uh, for every one of you who are unfamiliar with this, did you know that there's freedom in the truth? There's freedom in the truth. If you're living by a lie, you're living in captivity to something that was, that was not what you were made to be living. When you live in the truth, you're, you're living life as God intended you to live. And God, being your designer and creator, knows exactly what's best for you and for your family and for the people that you're, are in your circle. He knows. And if you embrace the truth of God's Word, the truth will set you free. There is freedom in Jesus. So, just as a touch point here, in the Gospel of John, the Apostle John uh, writes of Jesus and what Jesus had to say to his disciples. And um, he said this in John chapter 8, 31 and 32. Jesus said, To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What a refreshing scripture. Isn't that a refreshing scripture? If we come to the knowledge of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we come into a relationship with God, there is freedom. Now everybody wants freedom out there and everyone's trying to find freedom in all the wrong places. But I want you to know today, there is freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. There is freedom through the, the, the relationship that God has established with us through Jesus Christ. So, Look no further. The truth will set you free. So the Apostle of John writes, he writes to Gaius, and he says this, he says, in verse 2 he says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go with you, well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling you how to continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So John, we see here, he considers this man Gaius both a friend and a spiritual son. It's, it, it's very likely that, that John maybe had something to do with Gaius coming to faith in Jesus. Nobody knows for sure, but it's, it's likely that he did. Maybe he came through when John was preaching on his traveling. Um, he came to know Jesus through that. Uh, we don't know, but he calls him his friend and, and his spiritual son. And, and he prays for Gaius. Um, he prays for health in his body. He prays for health in his soul and, and general prosperity over his um, affairs and everyday living. I want you to know that we don't we don't claim these things. Health, wealth, prosperity. That's not something we claim. That's something God chooses to bestow upon us in seasons of our lives. Because there's some times where you might benefit more by going through times of persecution and suffering in, in all areas where God knows that you need what you need when you need it. The, but the issue is coming to trust in the Lord and trust that He has your best interest in mind. And sometimes we don't understand that. Sometimes we don't understand why things happen the way they do. But we need to trust the Lord because He has eternal perspective on everything. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't pray for one another. We pray for one another for health. And God is a healer. He can heal you just like that if you're sick, if that's His purpose. He can make things go well for you when, when in your secular affairs. I just want to share this. Jonathan, for instance, Pastor Jonathan. I mean, he, just, he, was, trying to, he was wrestling with whether this was God's will for him or not to come here. I hope you don't mind me using me as an illustration. But... <sighs> The day after he accepted, or within a day or so, 
Someone in our church um, had heard at, from work, from their secular work, that there was a place that was open for rental. This place just happens to be with a born-again Christian couple that I know quite well. They're very wonderful, lovely people. And, and, and the apartment that, that they had uh, it just happens to be coming open right now at a reasonable price. And it's got, it's got everything Jonathan is going to need to start out. It's fully furnished. It's, it, it's just perfect. And I heard this through the channels um, of someone who phoned me and said, hey, maybe you should check into this. So I called them. I got the phone number. I called them. And, and she's like, oh, you read my email? And I'm like, what email? Evidently, in, at the same time that the people from our church told me that maybe I should check with them because this is open, they heard from somewhere else that a, a new youth pastor was coming into town and might need a place to stay, and they sent us an email saying, hey, this is the kind of scenario that we want for a rental. Okay, this is the blessing of God. Nothing less than the blessing of God. This is God's provision. John is praying, you know, he's, he prays for the health of Gaius, for things to go well in his, his secular affairs. It's not wrong for us to pray, pray for this, these things. God knows what we need and supplies all of our needs. Paul once said in Philippians chapter 4, 6, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. Right? It goes on. I could preach on that, a whole sermon on that. But, you know, the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will then guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You can trust God, and you can be at rest knowing that He's got your best interest in mind. Even if you're sick, even if things aren't going so well, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on in your understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways, and He will make your path straight. We should pray for one another. The scriptures encourage us to pray for one another. Praying is one of those things that God has given us provision to do that absolutely makes a real difference in our circumstance. It makes a difference. And Ephesians chapter 6, 18, Paul also says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. That spells it out there, right? God calls you because you're the church calls you to pray for one another. Pray for one another. Get to know one another so that you know each other's needs so that you can bring each other before the throne of grace and ask the Lord to intervene on your behalf. And you know, it, it's never selfish. It's always, we're to pray for others. Yeah, we pray for our own needs, but if you're outward focused and you're, you're, you're praying for others, you can bet, no, I shouldn't say bet, you can, you can know that God will work circumstances out for you as well. You can't, you can't outgive the Lord. So, um, the Apostle Paul reassured the Philippian church, for instance, in Philippians 4.19, and he said this, this is a promise. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? If you've got a need, God knows your needs. Even before you pray. But the Lord wants you to bring your requests before him. Does God need me to pray to make something happen in someone else's life? Absolutely not. God can meet any need he wants to, any time he wants to, any, in any way that he wants to. He doesn't need me to, to intervene. He doesn't need you to intervene. It's not like we're mixing some potion in a big pot going, eh, if I had a little bit more of this, then God's going to listen to me. No. He knows what you need before you pray it. But God has chosen because he loves you chosen you to be his sons and daughters and wants you to participate with him in the work of the kingdom. So when you pray, you align yourself with the heart of God 
And your heart beats in rhythm with God's heart for others. And when you start to pray for other people, God puts them on your heart. And all of a sudden, you begin to look at them differently. You begin to see them as loved by the Lord. And as being loved by the Lord, you begin to treat them accordingly. So you start to, you start to do as well as pray. God wants us to be doers of the Word, not just hearers only. So, concerning the theme and the purpose of 3 John, it appears that the Apostle's primary thrust is to contrast between the truth and the servanthood of Gaius and the error of another man that we're going to talk about in a little bit and the selfishness of that man. So he's trying to contrast. And he wants to warn those who are walking properly in the faith, in the truth of God, to beware of the pitfalls that are all around. Now, in verse, verses 5 to 8, John continues. And he's direct, remember, he's directing his, his, uh, his, his letter here to Gaius. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. Wow. Stop and think about what I just read there for a second. What a legacy to live. What a legacy. Gaius was the kind of person that the Apostle John calls his dear friend, not just peripheral. He calls him a dear friend. John commends him for being faithful for what he was doing for the brothers and sisters in the faith. You see, Gaius was lovingly helping missionaries carry their calling from God to take the gospel into the world. And he did it not knowing even who some of them were. Now I imagine he had a knowledge that he was giving to the work of Christ, probably from other believers who said, yeah, these, these guys are on track. They're taking the gospel in, in its pureness to the world of unbelievers that, that need to hear about Jesus. So, so I think Gaius, he, he, was, he was supporting them financially the way you read this in context. These preachers of the gospel were telling the church. They were reporting back to, Gai- back to Gaius's church how Gaius was so generous in supporting their cause and, and he was doing it as an act of love. These ministers of the gospel, you see, they didn't have to go out and try to make a living from the unsaved world around them But as a result of the generosity of people like Gaius, they were able to focus on preaching the gospel and pour their whole life into it. Now I've heard this before. and I haven't always been a pastor. I've asked myself these questions too. Some will say to themselves, let the missionaries, pastors, and preachers of the gospel support themselves. If they feel called to this ministry, they should put their own money where their mouth is. And work work in the secular fields like everyone else has to. Why should I share my hard-earned resources with them? They should make their own way. After all, Paul the Apostle was a tent maker. Yes, he was. Paul the Apostle was also single. Wasn't married. Paul the Apostle was also exceptional in certain ways. But these people that were being sent out by by the church and were going, traveling and taking the gospel out, Gaius was taking it on himself to, 
to share his resources that God had blessed him with to help them. You see, sadly, some folks that take the approach of this is mine, this is mine, and it belongs to me, belongs to no one else, and I'm going to do what I want with the things that I've got. Right? I believe if that's, that's a person sitting in our churches anywhere, here included, you're missing out on a huge blessing. You're missing out on a huge blessing, huge spiritual blessing. The commendation of the Apostle John of Gaius is one of the greatest references to God taking pleasure in a person who helps establish his work in promoting the gospel going forward. You see, Gaius was a blessing to the apostles. He was a blessing to those who were called out into the mission field to the missions work. He was a blessing to the church. He was a blessing to everyone he came into contact with. Why? Not because he was fishing for compliments or anything like that. He was doing this because he loved God and he wanted to see God's kingdom come. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the heart of Gaius. You know, maybe you haven't been gifted to take the gospel forward, to preach or to go to another country and establish a mission where people are coming to the the knowledge of Christ or translate the Bible in in a far-off land like our missionary here two weeks ago. Maybe you're not, that's not your gifting. Maybe you find that you're, you're placed in one place and you're you're settled in one place and God's put you in this place and you've got responsibilities to take care of. You've got things to do right here. You see, that's fine. As a matter of fact, that's necessary. Not everybody is called to go somewhere. Sometimes people, for the most part, people are, are called to plant themselves where God has placed them. And not just to be planted, but to bloom where you're planted. Maybe you're not gifted by God to preach or to establish a new mission. But if you find your circumstance is here, there's other things that God wants to use you in. And one of the ways, in this particular case, with Gaius, was that Gaius was used by God to, to, to further the kingdom work with his finances. Now, I'm not here to talk about money. I'm just, this is plain in Scripture. And we're going through verse by verse. And for those of you who are coming here, we talk, we, it's a conviction on my heart that we need to preach the Word of God. And whatever comes our way when we're preaching the Word of God, we're going to talk about that. Because that's where the Holy Spirit works in us, is through the Word of God. The Holy Spirit brings God's Word to life in us and teaches us how we ought to carry ourselves. And God knows best when we walk in the truth. When we walk in the truth of God's Word, God's blessing rests on us. And God wants us to walk in His blessing. Amen. That's just a side note. As a common man or woman in the church, your money, your prayers, your practical support can do uncommonly great things in the kingdom of God. Your generosity in supporting the work of Christ in the background is just as important as the actual work being done on the front lines, in the mission field, in the church, wherever the gospel is taken forward. Preachers and missionaries can't do what they've been called to do if it weren't for the generosity of God's saints backing them. As a minister of the gospel, you're just like everyone else. There's 24 hours in a day. Seven days in a week. You only have so much time. As a result, your your interests have to be divided. And you have to you, you're accountable to God for how you, you divide your interests. But like like let's for, let's t- talk about our missionary that came here two weeks ago. I am so thankful for you guys. We bless that man and his wife. Stan and Sandy go to in- I can't talk about the country they go to. Actually I shouldn't, because we have to vet it out of our online <laughs> because it's a very sensitive country. But in Asia, they've got a a mission in Asia where they're going into 
a, a certain country in Asia where there's unreached people groups. I was talking to Stan when we, were, we went out on the lake and we were just chatting. He says eight, there's 18 people groups that he identified last, last summer that don't have the written word of God in their language that, whose, whose primary language doesn't have a translation. So, so Stan is going back to this country. He's just waiting on the call from his mission. He's going to go back into this country. And you know what? La, la, uh, two Sundays ago, we took a love offering for him. Thank you. We sent him with $3,300. And it, just wasn't, it wasn't just from one source. People gave generously. This is what I'm talking about, folks. This is what I'm talking about. Now Stan doesn't have to worry about having to figure out a way how to support what he's doing and he can focus on preparing for it. And, and when he goes, he doesn't have that burden to carry. And you know how that happens is when it's unlocked by God's people who God blesses with all kinds of different things and giftings. Don't say I'm not gifted by God. If you're planted here, you're gifted by God. You're given provisions by God. And the reason why he gives you his provisions as his people is so that his kingdom could be established in your community and in the world around you where he's calling traveling preachers like Stan to go. You guys didn't even know it. I didn't introduce him as Dr. Stan. He's actually a doctor of the... He's got a doctor in some kind of linguistics or whatever. <laughs> the man knows like six or seven languages. But all that, all that study and stuff like that has drawn his resources, and he depends on the church to help him. Okay, I hate to harp on this point, but this is such an important thing. This is what Gaius was doing right. Gaius was doing this right. And, and in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17-19, it's very clear that ministers of the gospel on the local church level like me are supposed to remind you of this. Paul said to Timothy, young pastor Timothy, he said this in 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. God wants you to take hold, me to take hold of the life that is truly life. This isn't, it's not all about, you know, I mean, I like, I like going fishing and I like hunting and that sort of things and outdoor stuff. It's, it's not all about the toys that I have in my shed. He richly provides us so that we can do the things that we enjoy and we thank Him for it. But that's not the focus. That's, that's peripheral if we're blessed with those sort of things. Those are peripheral things. God's focus for us and what He wants us to do is to focus on His kingdom. Thy kingdom come. This is the Lord's prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Right? This is God speaking to us. And this is how He wants us to pray. Thy kingdom come. Well, how can I participate in God's kingdom being established? I'm telling you a way right here. Maybe you're called to preach. Maybe you're called to go to the mission field or be an, a next-gen pastor like our, our young pastor here. Maybe that's you. Do what you come called to do. Do it in the name of Jesus. If you're called to stay here and plant yourself here, then do it in the name of Jesus. And God will give you the wisdom on what you should do with what he's given you, no matter what that is, whether it's giftings uh, practically or whether it's giftings spiritually. They're both important. You see, it's all about servanthood. We serve Jesus. It's all about God. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, friends, we need to take this to heart. We are called to be servants. Servants of God. Just like Jesus was a servant. We're called to be imitators 
of Jesus, imitators of the apostle. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus, we, we know in Philippians 2, it says that we're supposed to follow his example of servanthood. In Matthew 20, 25b to 28, Jesus told his apostle John, see, John learned this the hard way because John and James's mother wanted them to be kind of, mm-hmm. I want you to sit next to Jesus when it comes into the kingdom. Uh, sit, sit next to him. Uh, so she went to, to Jesus and asked if James and John could be given special privilege to sit at the, at the, at the next to Jesus in the kingdom to come. And what did Jesus say? He said this. Jesus told the Apostle John, his brother James, and everyone else listening to him, the other ten disciples were a little put off by that. He said this. He says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great, become great among you, must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Beautiful. All who come to believe in Jesus Christ. Everything you are and everything you have belongs to him. It belongs to him. We're stewards of the things God has provided for us. And he knows you from the foundations of the universe that you are his child. So he planned for you to participate with him in prayer and in the practical working of the ministry, no matter what that looks like. You're part of this, and God planned it so. So take a look at what God's blessed you with the giftings he's blessed you with, and pray. Ask the Lord, I can't tell you this, ask the Lord, what should I do, Lord, to further your kingdom so that people could come to know you? So that heaven is populated and you can use us, Lord, to to walk in step with you, just like the loaves and fishes, you know? Jesus gave them the bread and they passed the bread to the next person and the miracle happened was nothing to do with the people who were passing out the bread. It was everything to do with the God who blessed the bread and asked them to pass it out. You don't dictate how God's kingdom is built. God does. But he wants you to step with him. He wants to call to experience the joy of his kingdom, of his work. Experience the joy. There's no greater joy than to be walking in step with the Holy Spirit and being obedient to the Lord. Ah. So, thank you for those of you who gave generously to Stan and Sandy. That's going to go an awful long ways to help him go back to this country and to do, continue the work of, of God in translating those, those scriptures. Or being this, he's actually the front runner. He's the one that goes out and, and tests the ground, and then he brings back the, uh, the, uh, the needs to his team, and then they begin Bible translation. Thank you for giving to the Lord. There's a saying about servanthood, and the saying applies. And the saying is this, put others before yourself, and you can become a leader among men. A true leader among men is one who is not concerned about himself or herself. A true leader among men is one who pours themselves out for the sake of other men and women. That's what we want to do as a church, is to pour ourselves out for the sake of the gospel so that those that don't know will come to know. And and those that are on the pathway will be encouraged and discipled to become more like Jesus every day. That's what it's all about, friends. John encourages Gaius to help him in his good work of unselfish hospitality and generosity to those who are working for the expansion of God's kingdom. 
In doing so, John not only commends Gaius for embracing the proper perspective, he not only does that, but he also comes to a point here in this, in this book where he warns him. He warns him of another man who is at operation in the church that he's from. Now, we believe, we actually believe, and uh, I think there's some evidence in Scripture about this, that John, at the time of this writing, was, was in Ephesus, and that, that his book was being addressed to the church in Corinth, where Gaius was. So there's this other man that comes onto the scene in John's writing here, a man who is actually being used by Satan as a negative influence on the congregation of believers, even though he was part of a church. This man was a danger to the health of the work of Christ, and there was actually the potential there for him to lead people astray and to even derail Gaius, who was doing right. So John speaks to us about this man, and he actually speaks to this man by name. I don't think that John would have spoken this guy's name had he not intended for this man to take heed of what he was doing and repent. Nevertheless, if he wouldn't repent, the church needed to be warned about this man and about what he was doing and about everything that was taking place surrounding him. There's this man named... Now, where's my wife? She's downstairs. Okay, I had the pronunciation of this name right. And she's like, that's right. And now I can't... What was the name? That... Um, Yeah, it's not how, Diotrephus. Truth, oh. Diotrephes, yes. I don't know why that won't stick in my head. It's Greek, right? It's Greek to me. <laughs> Diotrephes. Diotrephes is this guy. So let's see what John has to say in warning Gaius about Diotrephes, uh, starting from verse 9. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers, and he, stops those, he also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Wow. This is a huge deal here, right? This is a big one. Diotrephes. At the time of this writing, again, we believe that John was writing from Ephesus. And uh, actually, uh, Gaius is, is mentioned by Paul. We th think it might be the same person. It could be another Gaius, but I'm just going to read it because I think it fits. The church in Corinth had a lot of trouble. The church in Ephesus had a reputation for being a lot more stable than the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth had all kinds of doctrinal errors going on and crazy stuff that was happening and there was division and all kinds of false teaching and stuff that they had to tackle. They were very alive on some fronts and other fronts they really had problems. In 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 1, 10 to 14, Paul says about this congregation in Corinth, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. My brothers and sisters come from Chloe's household, have informed me that, when, that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas, which is Peter. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except for Crispus and Gaius. Like John, Gaius is mentioned by name here by Paul as being a good man. Oh, what is that? How do I pronounce that again? Diotrephes? 
is not mentioned by name here. But Paul also has concerns over the state of division which had risen up in the Corinthian church. The issues were so concerning that the Apostle John calls out one of those who were causing trouble by name to try and correct this. The man, Diotrephes, or De, oh boy, I'll stick with that one. He appears to be the polar opposite of the character of Gaius. Both are in the church. Gaius is this giving, loving, generous man. Well, Diotrephes wanted to be first. He was not settled to be a servant of God and others like Gaius. He wanted to be first. He wanted to be the top dog with all the power in the church. He was jealous of anyone who might come along with the potential to unseat him from his place of control. And from verses 9 and 10, this man slandered John, we see, and other servants of God who were trying to minister to the church. He was actually jealous of the apostles and the other believers who had a genuine interest in furthering the message of God's kingdom into the world. You see, according to what we read here in 3 John, this man was not particularly concerned with seeing the kingdom of God spread to others. When you look at this, he really was wanting the church to operate like his own exclusive club. Have you ever been in, in a church where it feels like it's an exclusive club where only certain people are welcomed? <laughs> it's still alive and well today, the spirit. We don't want anything to do with that here. Everyone is welcome. We want to welcome everyone. No matter who you are, no matter what you are, no matter what background you come from, no matter what race you are, no matter what religion you used to have, no matter what your struggles were, no matter whether you come from poor circumstances or rich circumstances, we're all the same in Christ. Man, woman, boy, girl, doesn't matter. Everyone is in the same place. Diotrephes was not particularly concerned with seeing the kingdom of God spread to others. He wanted the church operating to serve him and his interests. Where people didn't fit in the direction that he wanted to pull, they were sim simply categorized, cast aside, and pushed out of fellowship with the rest of the church. Uh, hey, the church, I should say, he wanted them to push them out as well. He was not only content to cast off those who didn't embrace his ideals, but he also was attempting to recruit, to groom, and poison other people to have the same negative viewpoints that he was holding. And I'm sure that this would have been a source of deep sorrow and deep division within the local assembly, possibly the assembly in Corinth. Diotrephes would not uh, submit to the authority of God's appointed leadership in, in the church. In his heart, he was jealous of the apostles. He wouldn't, wel he wouldn't even welcome the traveling apostles. It appears he was a man who had significant influence too. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had such sway. And John warns Gaius not to become swayed by Diotrephes, not to be swayed about his gossip about the servants of God, and in doing so, fall into the trap of becoming one of, uh, one of the disciples of this man. Because John explains what he was sowing in the church was not from God. It was not from God. But it was in fact evil. And he says to Gaius in verse 11, Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. See, Gaius came to the saving knowledge of Christ and it transformed him. Diotrephes, on the other hand, had a form of godliness but no power in it. And he was out for himself, not for the kingdom and the greater good of everyone out there. So, John tells Gaius that there was this man 
who he had to be careful about. He, had to, he warned him about it. And I'm sure that this letter probably got back to uh, Diotrephes as well. Possibly he heard and was penitent. Although oftentimes when confronted, people pull back into their own ways and refuse to listen because that's where their heart is. They're, they're unteachable. They're people who have no regard for authority that's been placed over them by God. So, John's like, don't have anything to do with what this man's doing, Gaius. But follow the Lord, because there's other people in the church with you that are also following the Lord the right way too. So he then brings up another man's name. He says, he says, he tells him about this man named Demetrius. Demetrius, a man who is well spoken by John. And what he, what he, I think what the apostle is trying to do here is he's trying to say to the church to be strong and stable as God intended, to cling to the teachings of this truth of Scripture and to partner with others who also have the heart of God for for following the truth as God intended. Band together with them. He says of Demetrius in verse 12, Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone. So you see he flips from the, uh, whatever his name was <laughs> to Demetrius. Demetrius is well spoken by everyone. And even by the truth itself. Wouldn't you want to be known as a person who is spoken well of everyone, even by the truth itself? Wow, what, a, what a, an encouragement. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. So after leaving Gaius with this thought, John closes his letter in verses 13 to 15 saying, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their messages. Greet the friends there by name. See the love? There's love. And just like Scripture, you know, there's teaching and there's correction, there's rebuking. All of this is from the Lord. And training in righteousness so that the man and woman of God may be fully equipped for every good work. That's God's heart for you today. So, do I have a heart sometimes like Diotrephes? In my life, I'm going to be honest, I've had to repent of a few things before. Yeah. Maybe you have too. So let's not all say that we don't struggle through things and work through things because all of us have to work through things. If you're here today and you've had a heart like Diotrephes, you need to repent and come back to the right path. And God gives you that opportunity. There is no one beyond the reach of God's grace. God's grace is great. It's greater than all of our sin. So if there's a hard point in a heart that needs to be softened and broken, submit yourselves unto the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen? And if you are like Gaius, don't be discouraged in the good work that God's called you to. Sometimes it may seem long and hard and you wonder even if what you're doing is doing any good. But the fruit of righteousness is being carried through you to others. Be encouraged to keep doing the good work that God is doing in you. And follow others as examples too. And band together with others who have a heart after God to see his kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Would you pray? Jesus, we thank you for the power in the book of Third John. Power to change us power to encourage us in the faith. 
Your word is truth, Lord, and we thank you for your truth that sets us free. God, if there's anyone listening here today or over the internet that uh, needs to get their lives right with you, maybe there's been a path taken off the, the path that they should be on, Lord. I just pray, God, that you would, you'd speak to them and that they would humble themselves right now before you and ask for you to restore them back to the right way. Some of us, our love can grow cold. Some of us have experiences of hurt and we've been hurt on so many fronts and we need to let go of the hurt that's been done to us and the pain that rises up within us that causes us to choke, causes us to have an attitude that is wrong. Sometimes we respond wrongly when we are harmed and that becomes a stumbling block in us because of unforgiveness. Lord, release us from that. If, that's, if there's anyone here today that has that happening, God, help them to release it. Help us to have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but embrace the truth of life. Encourage those that are doing what is right, God, today. Encourage their hearts, Lord. May they be refreshed in you. We pray for your blessing, health, and, and strength to the people of this assembly, God, so that we can do your work for the sake of your kingdom. We are not our own, Lord. We are bought with the precious blood that you shed. And we thank you. We are so thankful, Lord, for all that you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, would grace and peace rest on these people in abundance this week as they go. And bless the food as we go down to the barbecue in our, in our visitation with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.